Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome in this upper law uh, uh, area, very big one, and to attend this Academia Ophthalmologica Internationalis meeting. For those who do not know exactly what is AOI or Academia, it is founded in 1975 by Jules Francois, professor of Belgium, and he is honorary life president uh, of this society. It is a university-centered international organization. All the speakers that you will hear today in this session are members of this Academia Ophthalmologia Internationalis. I myself the president, then the vice presidents are Yalang Zhao, Justine Smith, the general secretary is the co-chair Richard Abbott, the treasurer is Martin Jager. The aims of this society are a little bit peculiar maybe, but nonetheless it will promote education in research and appropriate medical um, services to preserve and restore vision for people of the world. So it is really international and programs of those who would like to, to uh, hear a little bit more or learn a little bit more about that society. The AOI website has been renewed completely by our general secretary, thank you for that. And uh, there you will find a little bit more about what the AOI is doing. It is my pleasure now to invite Richard Abbott, who will speak about management of the unhappy patient after cataract surgery. Good afternoon. Uh, I have no uh, financial interest to disclose. Uh, my topic is management of the unhappy patient following ca cataract surgery, but I thought it would be more interesting to talk more about how to avoid having an unhappy patient following what we consider to be perfect cataract surgery. So you've done the surgery and you think it was perfect and uh, the patient is unhappy. And what are some of the problems that you may face? Certainly you could have missed something uh, preoperatively. There was inadequate informed consent. Maybe you didn't handle the expectations of the patient appropriately. And during the postoperative period, maybe not enough time or support for the patient. So what do we need to do to pay extra attention to the patient? Well, I think, first of all, the tear film is something we tend to neglect often. And this is a quote from a past president of the ASCRS, where he talks about ophthalmologists spending a lot of money on technology to achieve relatively small improvement in the results of cataract and even refractive surgery compared to what we can do by managing the ocular surface. Certainly, ocular surface disease can, uh, is common in both refractive and cataract surgery populations and can certainly affect the visual outcome, the comfort, and the quality of life of the patient. We also know that it can affect the accuracy of the preoperative tests including refraction, topography, and even the IOL calculation. So our recommendation is to spend the time and manage the appropriate, potentially troublesome issues in a patient prior to surgery. Also, in your topography, look for form first keratoconus. As a cornea specialist, we see this not infrequently where the cornea has an irregular shape and sometimes is missed. The informed consent is extremely important. Uh, it should be given in advance of surgery and that doesn't mean 15 minutes before the operation, but several days before. So the patient has an opportunity to think about it and also an opportunity to ask questions to the surgeon. A big problem is because we are so successful with the surgery, we tend to trivialize the surgery. And when you do that, the patient expects that everything will go perfectly. It is also important from a medical legal perspective that you 
carefully document the discussion in the medical record. Marketing materials, information on the internet, if this is put out by you or your practice, your office, these are all considered part of the informed consent. And you have to make sure that your materials are up to date and you have to make sure you understand what your staff or your group is marketing to the patient because this is what they will expect. Patient selection also is very important. What kind of personality does the patient have? Maybe they don't understand and accept the information you give them. Do they truly understand that they may be presbyopic if their nearsighted vision, their reading vision is not corrected? Are their expectations realistic? So it really is about expectations and realistic expectations. The advent of personal information technology has made the practice of ophthalmology more challenging than ever. And I think all of us have experience with the patients coming into our office and almost telling us what they expect and what we should do. Many believe that surgery will totally eliminate refractive error and presbyopia, will improve happiness, popularity, will improve their golf game, their handicap will be less. So their expectations really have to be managed even with what we consider to be perfect surgery. Acquiring information on the internet has changed our relationship with our doctors. There's been a shift in how patients relate to us and even how we relate to patient. So we really need to spend the time to understand what is the patient's understanding about the surgery. You can find on the internet many glowing reports about the outcomes of cataract surgery, and we do have fantastic outcomes, but we also know that every patient doesn't achieve that. Patients network with family and friends, and when something is not perfect in their mind, they become angry and disappointed and upset. The wonders of new technology, that it can correct everything, often doesn't materialize for the patient. The best way to understand what's going on with the patient is to use a questionnaire to talk to the patient about their responses in the questionnaire to make sure they understand. Ask them what they expect from the surgery, how they assess their stability. Are they reasonable? Are they perfectionists? Watch out for patients who are on antidepressants, antidepressants or mood elevators. Also engineers, pilots, even doctors, lawyers can be difficult patients. And those that where their work, where they drive mostly at night, or pilots where glare can be an issue, you really have to manage their expectations also very carefully. Talk to the patient yourself or use the patient counselor. But if you use a counselor, you need to train them and make sure they're telling the patients what you want them to tell them. Sometimes the counselors will paint a very glowing picture about how fantastic you are and you're a magician with surgery. And this gives them a very unrealistic expectation. So summary recommendations, identify the troublesome patient prior to surgery. I rely on my staff to tell me if there is somebody who is particularly nasty or rude because often they're nice to me and uh, this is a sign of their true personality. Always spend adequate time with the patient, at least several days prior to surgery, to have the informed consent discussion. In the state of California, if the surgeon himself or herself did not have the discussion with the patient, it is considered that no informed consent was performed. Pay close attention to the patient's preoperative expectations regarding the surgery. Listen to what the patient says. Ask the patient, what have you heard about the surgery? What is your goal? How will your daily life be affected? How will you feel if you still need to wear glasses or contacts after the surgery? Pay attention to your staff and the recommendations of the staff because the patient's personality often will reveal themselves more to the staff than to you as the surgeon. 
assess how the patient might handle a less than perfect outcome, but also ask yourself how you will handle that if you have a problem or an unhappy patient. How will you deal with this? And how will this affect your office practice? Document all your findings and discussion in the medical record, and do not hesitate to turn down a patient for surgery if their expectations are really unrealistic or you feel their personality is not appropriate for what you can offer them. If a patient is unhappy, pay extra attention, listen carefully, and show empathy and compassion. This will go a long way in helping the patient. It's really quite simple. It's looking at the sign where you just stop a minute and you think, and it kind of makes sense, all these ways to handle the patient and manage these expectations. So it's very important as you hear my colleagues talk about complications and management of complications. I think upfront handling the patient, choosing the right patient is really very important to helping to avoid future problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm not sure whether there are questions from the audience that, are, that you would like to ask. Otherwise, there are some microphones here in the beginning. I think it was straightforward. Thank you very much. So then I, I will start my talk. And I will present to you one of the techniques to help the unhappy patient in order to have an IOL exchange. Because indeed, at a certain moment, you will have to explant these lenses. Not all, you have to do all the tests, aberometers, uh, uh, topographers, uh, glare tests, contrast sensitivity tests, do as much as possible tests in order to really, really understand what it is about and what is the complaint of the patient before to decide uh, what technique and whether you are going to do an IOL exchange. Of course, in the presence of an intraocular lens, the, the biggest uh, problem often, uh, these are is my, uh, is my, are my disclosures, sorry for that. I have a consultancy for Zeiss, Thea, Zimmer Physiol, financial disclosure. I have an intellectual property on the back in the lens and ring caliper that will also be presented. And I would also like to acknowledge the co my co-worker, Sorkan Igul, who uh, collaborated, and also Inge Lesse, who collaborated on these IOL exchange uh, surveys. The indications for IOL exchange in the past has been published quite a lot, and mainly it was IOL opacification, IOL decentration, IOL dislocation, capsular contraction, corneal decompensation, incorrect IOL power, damaged intraocular lens, or IOL-related chronic uveitis. But nowadays, it changed a little bit, and I do not have the, 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 the graph here, but nowadays, it is, in fact, unhappy patient after refractive surgery that, that comes at number one. These are all the different cases that you will be faced with. Opacities, really completely decentration, dislocation, in fact. Decentration of intraocular lens, and here you have one example, a dramatic example of a dislocation of the intraocular lens in a multifocal intraocular lens. And I will come a little bit more closer about that topic. And here you have a real beautiful case of capsule contraction of the anterior capsule. These are the most dramatic cases to, to explain because the zonules most of the time are already very, very weak. Do not forget that when you have a very opaque capsule, anterior capsule, the pupil will be defined by this area and not anymore by the area of the iris itself. Now, when you look at the patients with uh, multifocal intraocular lenses, just a little trick. Look or project a round object on the lens at your slit lamp, and then you will see whether that object is still round when projected on the lens. If it is not any more round, 
oval like in this case, that means that your lens is bent. And a multifocal lens that is bent gives really bad quality of vision, lots of coma. So that patient, then you do not have to make many, many tests. You know it's from advance. That will become an exchange. Here again, just like I said, very, very opaque anterior capsule. Patient will have very narrow field, a very, very dark uh, quality of vision in mesopic condition. And then here you see that there is a kind of small decentration, but decentration alone, that you cannot explain the disappointment of the patient. Therefore, if you want to understand, you have to measure tilt of the lens. And tilt of the lens is something that again will give rise to coma aberrations and unsatisfied patients. Now, this is a very old video, but I like to show this video because when you look at it, you will think, oh, that's easy to understand why the patient is unhappy. This anterior capsulorexis was decentered, performed by the surgeon who did the primary surgery. And that was also my, my idea. And I said, OK, I will have to clean everything and I will have to explant this lens. And oh, no, this is not a good one. Sorry for that. So I start then to, to peel. And peeling of the capsular back means, in fact, that you are taking away the secondary proliferation. Oh, I don't know why it, you don't. OK. Here I try to, to, uh, uh, to mobilize the lens within the capsular back. And you see that you have the folds there. There is a problem here. OK. I start with peeling of this proliferative tissue, once that the lens is taken out. And I do a bimanual technique. One hand, I pull on the proliferative tissue. And with the other hand, I keep the capsular back stable. And then you realize how huge that proliferation is. And this is, of course, understandable because the lens epithelial cells are lying on the inner face of the anterior capsule. And these are the ones that will be responsible for that contraction and for that proliferative tissue. And then I started a technique to standardize a technique how to deal with peeling of proliferative tissue at the level of the border of the anterior capsulorexis. And then I thought, if we can scrape the lens, the cells from the endothelium, why not to use that same scraper in order to find the definition or a line or delineation of that proliferative tissue at the inner face of the anterior capsule, and then to try and, uh, this way to try to get it mobilized. And you see that it works, and it works at each time that you do. Be patient and try it again and again but silently and very quietly. And then suddenly you will see that you can indeed define that proliferative tissue, pull it away from the, from the uh, anterior capsule. Next step, you have mobilized it. Then you try to, uh, to take away everything. But observe when you do that. Observe how the capsule reacts because the capsule, of course, is suspended by the zonules. And if you have huge proliferation as that, like that, and you pull on it, you will lose your zonules. So then you have to rethink, and you have to use bimanual techniques. You support the capsular back while pulling on the proliferative tissue. Always only go, only progress when you see that it is safe for the capsular bag, that there is no harm to the zonules. And here again, continue progress. It takes time, but it is worth, in fact, to do. Because then you see at the end of your, pro of your um, process, you will see that you have, again, a normal anterior capsulorexis. So that deformed anterior capsulorexis is really only due to the proliferation of that secondary tissue that is originated from the lens epithelial cells that are reacting on the presence of a foreign body, which is the intraocular lens biomaterial.
And your proliferative tissue will be different dependent on the biomaterial. According to me, it is much easier to take away the proliferative tissue in silicone lenses, for example, than in hydrophobic lenses. They are very toughly attached to, to the capsule. Then you do what you want, you cut it. There are other techniques. I have another technique with a lasso that you can cut, but that's not really the aim of this uh, presentation. This is quite an interesting case because this is a patient who said, I'm absolutely unhappy, but immediately after surgery, approximately one month, two months after surgery, I was in fact happy. And then I said, let us do the risk or let us take the risk that I will try to peel everything. And if I'm ready, I will ask you during the surgery, if everything is fine, whether we keep the lens, yes or no, and, and, and the parameter that I will use is to see whether the lens is again aligned based on the Purkinje reflexes. And here, first step, peeling. Again, same method, by manual if you are unsure, if you have to pull too much, support your capsule so that the proliferative tissue come loose. This is a silicone lens. It goes, it's very big proliferation, but it comes easier loose from the posterior capsule than in the previous video. And you see that you have to do the 360 degrees. Sometimes, of course, it's not possible. And then you have to, to, to cut it or you, you have to stop. And if there is a little bit of proliferation, it doesn't matter that much. But in this case, I was capable to extract and to take away all the tissue. Then, of course, the next step will be that I will have to clean the posterior capsule. That's not so much difficult. You just uh, uh, inject behind the lens, you inject the um, viscoelastic material, and then you can clean it manually or eventually with a bimanual irrigation aspiration forceps. But you see the huge proliferation that may occur after traditional cataract surgery with the lens in the back implantation due to contact of cytokines from the ciliary sulcus, from the ciliary body, or whatever that transform the lens epithelial cells remaining in the capsular bag, transform them in myofibroblast and in uh, fibro fibrotic tissue. Then the next step is to, to make the anterior capsular axis as symmetrical as possible, uh, taking as, uh, as guide the optic of the intraocular lens. It was a huge one. Luckily, this patient didn't receive a YAC laser yet. And this is, of course, an other issue. If you think that a patient with multifocal intraocular lenses is unhappy, don't YAC the patient try first or consider first whether IOL exchange will eventually be the, op will be the solution because then you will make the work of the surgeon that will do the exchange much easier. And in this particular case, I didn't take the lens out. The patient, the alignment of the Purkinje 1 and, and 3 was absolutely good, so I left the lens in place and the patient was happy. So these are all cases, and I can show you different cases, different IOLs. We are quite a center that, that, to which people refer their cases of IOL exchanges, and I don't mind. I think this is nice to help those patients because they can be helped. And here, for example, the surgeon used already a capsule tension ring, and nevertheless, the zonules are very weak. And you will see that you have to take away within the groove, the proliferative groove that the haptics uh, have been embedded in by the proliferation of the lens epithelial cells. You pull them out in the, in the, in the orientation, in the plane of the lens or the capsular back, taking, pulling them out of the proliferative groove. And sometimes don't try to insist because you reduce more and more the, uh, um, the stability. And here, for example, I put a, cap, a caliper ring in order to know what is the size of this anterior capsular axis. And here you see YAC laser capsulotomy was already done, so I have to do an anterior 
vitrectomy. I put the back in the lens because it doesn't matter whether the, 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 the whether there are uh, remnants of tissue or proliferation in the periphery of the capsular bag. It will overlap that that all, and then you can have you can implant this lens quite easily. If the zonules are too weak, then you can even add bean shaped rings in order to increase the stabilization. So this is just, and I will stop here, uh, this is just to show that you have to understand proliferation of the lens epithelial cells is really one of the biggest enemy of the traditional uh, lens in the back implantation technique. They always are present at the level of the border of the anterior capsulorexis. They start at the and at the posterior phase of the anterior capsule, and they flip over the border anteriorly. Sometimes you can find delineation at the anterior capsule, sometimes better at the posterior capsule. But try to, to um, well, this is, for example, a lasso cutting system that you can put around the optic of the lens, you just screw it and then you see that the lasso will cut the lens. The advantage of this technique is that the, the, is that the lens is not moving too much in the anterior chamber and damage of the, reducing by that the damage to the endothelial cells. I would like to thank you for your attention and my conclusion is IOL exchange is something that we will have to perform more and more due to the advent of new intraocular lenses that are put on the market without clinical trial, proper clinical trial. So exchanges will be one of the solutions. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Don't know Professor Tezignon. Are there any questions in the audience for Professor Tezignon? Okay, there is one question. Uh, hi, great presentation. I wanted to ask about the um, circular projection you use. You say you project something to see if it's tilted oh, or not. Yeah, okay. What do you use? Can you explain? I just use the, I just use the uh, Purkinje reflexes of the light of the microscope. And I'm always sitting at a temporal position because then I have the right uh, the, the right compensation of the patient when he fixates the light of the microscope due to the angle kappa. And that is the reason why I sit at a temporal position of the patient. Now, depending on the microscope that you use, and that you have to ask specifically for your microscope, you have different projections of lights. And then you have the projection of the lights of the microscope, the one that is the most center with the optic of the microscope itself is the one the patient has to look at. That is the, the most important. That is in, then you align your eye with the optical axis of your the microscope of the of your microscope. Then you have to see the, you you do not see Purkinje two. That's the internal face of the cornea that you cannot see. Impossible. You cannot see Purkinje 3, sometimes yes, but that's projected very deep in the vitreous, but you can see 4. And the projection 4, it is anteriorly projected, and if you have an, an, a pseudophagic eye, you have it brightly present. So that's a good, a good way to try to, if you, well, to try to align by aligning Purkinje 1 and Purkinje 4. And if the patient is looking at the microscope, you have the perfect alignment. Thank you. And one other question, the um, circle that you project at the slit lamp to see if oh, the lens yeah. is tilted, how do you, what ah, do you no, use? That's, that's prior to surgery. I know, I know, but what yeah. do you use to, to project that image? Oh, we use the Tracy, the, the Tracy uh, Abarometer ah, okay. to do that. Yeah. yeah. Our next speaker is Professor Christophe Baudouin. Uh, from Paris, and he is going to discuss glaucoma and cataract to mix or not to mix. Professor Baudouin. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. This session is dedicated to cataract surgery and some of uh, the complications that may occur, or difficulties that may occur. And my talk will be, will be focused on the glaucoma surgery associated to uh, cataracts and especially we entitled that uh, to mix or not to mix. 
And uh, effectively, in the last decade, there were uh, an accumulation of wonderful devices and smart uh, products product that uh, have been developed uh, to try to help to get, to get a very good or much better glaucoma surgery. The question of the association with cataract uh, remains a, a subject of debate, and I will have an overview on the different technique, mostly focused on the one I know and I use, and this is my financial disclosure, but in fact I have no direct interest in this presentation. Uh, in case of cataract and glaucoma, uh, we have, and we, in the past, we had the choice between cataract alone and uh, proposing filtration surgery. So the advantage is that it's quite logical to add a trabeculectomy, uh, whatever the process, uh, to cataract in case of association of both. Uh, and uh, there are different advantages to do that, especially the fact that when we uh, perform a phaco emulsification, we are not sure of the result uh, we will get in terms of IOP control after surgery. And there is no risk of IOP peak, uh, no problem of compliance after uh, surgery with a different medication. However, we have to be aware that we will increase the rate of complication because we, have, we combine the complication of cataract, which is very low, but the, cataract, the risk of glaucoma surgery, which is uh, much higher. It takes longer time to recover in terms of vision. Sometimes the patient complains of irritation due to the stitch. Uh, it may be uh, uh, more difficult uh, uh, issue, uh, especially those related to the bleb. And, uh, and the effect is, uh, in fact, controversial. The, one of the problems, one of the issues, is the, the interest of cataract surgery alone. We know from the different study, the EGOL study, for example, that we may get an interesting result by uh, FACO only uh, in glaucoma patient, and it may be, and it has been recently considered, as a way to control glaucoma in cataract patient. And we know that we may get very good improvement in terms of IOP control. However, I just want to show you this, this study performed in my group. Uh, in, uh, not in all cataract uh, patients uh, with different angle size and opening, but just largely open angles. And in fact, the result is very disappointing. There is, in fact, a peak in terms of I, uh, IOP just at uh, day one and then a decrease of IOP, and at the end, it's a little bit significant, but in fact, the interest is uh, almost nothing in terms of IOP control. And the risk of peak above 30 millimeters of mercury is quite high. So the risk of having a, a damaging uh, condition after cataract surgery in those patients who have no narrow angle, no large uh, uh, lens, uh, are, is in fact uh, quite high and unpredictable. On the other side, if we decide to perform a standard trabeculectomy, we may face this kind of complication. The, those complications are not those of trabeculectomy, they are the complications related to the bleb. So there was a, a, an interest for developing intermediate techniques that could be a way to decrease the, the rate of complication or risk of complication. There are called, right, uh, right now, mixed mini inv minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. So you have a list of different techniques, and we can divide them into ab interno or ab externo, and we can divide uh, them into blebless or with associated with a bleb. And of course, it's different according to the technique you will choose. Uh, briefly, I want to start with a technique. I have no personal experience with that but there is an interest. One is a trabectum, the other one is a Kahook uh, dual blade. The, the interest of this technique is to open the trabecular meshwork to, to make the acus humor uh, uh, reaching the, uh, the acus vein, and this is a way to remember that uh, glaucoma is not a disease of Schlem's canal, but it's a disease of the access to Schlem's canal through damaged trabecular meshwork. So opening the trabecular meshwork may be a way to uh, make a more accessible aqueous humor to the, uh, to the, the vein and uh, uh, to decrease the pressure. And this can be uh, used as a standalone procedure or with cataract surgery. 
However, opening the, the trabecular meshwork may expose to risk of fibrosis, to synechia, or to hemorrhage. So to decrease this risk, I've been developed about uh, one decade ago, the, uh, the high stent micro, by, micro bypass uh, system with the first generation with this uh, shape and the, now the second generation, it's made in titanium and the interest is to cross the trabecular meshwork and to make uh, a contact uh, between the anterior chamber and Schlem's canal. So I can just show you a video of the new technique with the, uh, the new eye stent inject that is composed of two eye stents where you have to press a button that will introduce the stent into Schlem's canal through the uh, trabecular meshwork, one, and you have a second possibility. The fact that there is an hemorrhage is quite normal because there is a decrease of pressure in the anterior chamber, so reflux of blood from the aqueous vein uh, and, um, and uh, ophthalmic vein into Schlem's canal. When you open Schlem's canal, you get blood. This is normal. This may be an issue because you have to be careful in washing the blood away and to maintain some kind of pressure in the anterior chamber. If not, you will get a uh, small or more or less small hemorrhage into the anterior chamber. You can see here the, uh, the two eye stands. Again, the procedure and the result. So it seems to be interesting, and sometimes you have hemorrhage with spontaneous uh, evacuation uh, of, the, uh, of the, the blood, but sometimes you may have a peak of pressure that may be damaging uh, because the, the clot uh, will block the eye stand. I had uh, personally two, two cases like that. So you have to wait for a few days before uh, the blood has been uh, removed spontaneously. I, uh, but in some cases, you may have to reoperate the patient. This is a very, very complex uh, table uh, taken in the literature, just to illustrate the fact that the effect compared to uh, cataract surgery alone is an additional uh, decrease in IOP of approximately 15%. So you can be optimistic and say, oh, 15% more than cataract surgery alone, it's not bad at all, and it may be interesting for improving the, the, uh, the result in terms of IOP compared to the effect of cataract surgery. Or if you are more pessimistic, you will say, yes, but 15% is not, uh, not a lot. And if it is not a lot, it's not enough to control intraocular pressure. So you may deduce from my talk that probably it is uh, adapted to some kind of glaucoma patient and not for all glaucoma patients. Very quickly, the hydrus system, it's a much longer uh, system introduced in Schlem's canal uh, with results that seem to be also uh, quite interesting uh, compared to, sorry, uh, compared to, uh, to cataract surgery alone with an additional effect, again, around 20%, which is not bad at all, with a reduction of the number of medication. Uh, technically, the, uh, the main drawback is related to the fact that it's very long. In my hand, quite difficult to introduce in Schlem's canal, just to show you very quickly. You roll up the, the plunge and you introduce progressively with some blood, because again, there is always some blood in the Schlem's canal after cataract surgery, and progressively you push the, the, this long, long, long uh, stand into Schlem's canal uh, along the trabecular meshwork, and by transparency, you can follow the introduction. So, not so easy to, to manage, but uh, important to, ma to mention. A great hope was opened with the, the SIPA system and the, uh, the supracorridor drainage uh, way. Uh, after the, the, the cataract surgery, this kind of device could be, and uh, I talk in the past, could be introduced uh, through, uh, along the scleral spur uh, into the supracorridor space, and it seemed to be a promising technique. At two years, the results were good, but at four and five years, there was a dramatic decrease in terms of endothelial uh, loss, or endothelial density, which made the system totally uh, blocked by the authorities, and it's no more possible to use it. This example is just to 
mentioned that sometimes a very interesting technique that seemed to work well with a good safety uh, 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 profile could be could raise even after a few years some issue and we have to be very careful about the new technology so the procedure for our patient is now to follow them carefully on the other hand there are mix with blebs better blebs maybe maybe so the first one is the xen gel stent that is this tube uh, six millimeter long the, uh, the, the diameter, the internal diameter is 45 microns, and this, uh, this is introduced internally, uh, and uh, it goes uh, beneath the tenon capsule or beneath the conjunctiva, and sometimes we are not sure where, uh, exactly where it is. The bleb can be very nice, but sometimes it's, it can be blocked, and we have to, uh, to make and to perform needle, uh, needling after surgery in a significant number of cases according to the series between 30% and 60%. Personally, I, have, I, am more, I am closer to the 30%, but it may occur. And on the other hand, we have to be, to be uh, really aware that it remains a bleb-related technique, and sometimes the device may uh, disrupt from the conjunctiva you have here and the example, and effectively you can control that occurs more is effectively drained from the tube. But here it's not beneath the conjunctiva, but it's in the lacrimal field, which is not the goal. There were several complications of this kind of technique. They are not related to the tube itself or the material. They are related to the bleb. And when you observe this kind of cystic atrophic bleb here at two months after uh, after one of these surgery with exam, and unfortunately, more recently, the patient came to our emergency unit with this end of tamitis due to streptococcus. Another option is an ab external drainage system, also with a tube. The, uh, the advantage of this introduction is that you control exactly what you want to do with a pocket with this kind of bleb, calibrated bleb, then with the needle that is introduced. I'll show you the video, after putting a lot of mitomycin C. So compared to Xen, Xen is introduced ab interno and is, and is crossing the sclera and uh, egressing through the, the sclera beneath the conjunctiva. The advantage is the fact that you don't open the conjunctiva, but you don't always control exactly where is located the, uh, the, um, the device. On the other hand, this one requires to open the conjunctiva and the sclera, but you are sure that you introduce it in the right position, right place, with this pocket, and the tube is there, and on the other side, you can control that the aqueous humor is well uh, egressing from the tube, and then you have just to put and to suture the conjunctiva over the tube. However, it's still a bleb-associated technique, and there is no major difference in terms of bleb management with a trabeculectomy or for some uh, surgeon, deep sclerectomy. These are the results, interesting results, like with exam, with, however, a number of postoperative complications, like uh, requir requirement to go and, uh, and uh, make needling on the bleb, or complication related to the bleb. Here at day one, so it's uh, still uh, a little bit red, but you have the tube. My opinion is that it's still a little bit long, but pro probably it's uh, just a question of modifying uh, slightly the technique. Anyway, this technique seems to be also interesting, and we, we have the choice. And uh, the indication could be uh, proposed uh, according to the different type of requirement. A patient with cataract surgery uh, can be proposed a cataract alone if the patient has a well-controlled glaucoma with one drop, well-tolerated, good IOP control, uh, no progression of glaucoma, it's probably advisable to propose just phacoemulsification, and the patient will still have the, the, the initial medical treatment. In case of more moderate uh, or more severe, more severe glaucoma, in which we are not sure that cataract alone will be enough, we are not sure 
uh, to uh, we want to have an additional effect on pressure or we want to decrease the number of medication. But on the other hand, we don't want to take the risk of doing a, a filtration surgery with the bleb, with the fibrosis and so on. So in that case, the stent seems to be a good option. But in case of glaucoma requiring surgery and cataract surgery at the same moment, it will be uh, proposed to have a filtration surgery. In that case, it can be a trabeculectomy, it can be a xen or in focus, just because the two techniques or the three techniques have similarity, but the standardization of the technique is probably an advantage. In case of filtration surgery required, we, you have the choice between the standard technique and the more sophisticated one with the advantage and a drawback of each one. And in case of high risk of bleb, bleb encapsulation, ab internal surgery can be an option to avoid opening the conjunctiva. Supracoroidal drainage, but we are still looking at the appropriate uh, system or cyclo cyclodestruction. Thank you very much. Christophe, I think that this is a very beautiful overview of all the options and of course also your personal experience. Let us conclude that the last stent or mix is not yet there and that we might find some new devices in the future or even completely new approaches. We know as a cataract surgeon uh, in the past that you, we saw or in refractive surgery also, we have seen so many uh, wonderful devices disappearing after one or two years. Yeah. The, yeah. Just the time to be uh, attracted by the yeah, technique. Time will tell. Uh, it's, maybe it's, uh, the, the winner will be the later. Thank you very much. So now it is uh, my pleasure to ask Martin Jager to speak about keep an eye on the conch. So the, 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 in fact the beauty of the AOI is that it uh, is in society where we have quite a lot of different professors, international professors that are interested, they have different fields of interest. But anyway, even if she's mainly interested in, uh, in uh, tumors, it may be also interesting for cataract surgery, surgeons for, to time to time look at the conjunctiva. I have no financial disclosures. And the reason for this talk is a cataract surgeon who addressed me at the conference and said, I have this patient and she has a slightly weird lesion on the conjunctiva, but it is pink. It cannot be a melanoma, correct? Well, I'll show you. Conjunctival melanoma is a rare disease. Many arise from already a pigmented lesion, primary acquired melanosis, but they can also just occur de novo or from a prior nevus. And on average, the patients are about 60 years old, which approaches the age when people have cataract surgery. And the treatment for a conjunctival melanoma can be local excision, but if you only excise, it can recur. So often, ruthenium irradiation is used subsequently. They have a high recurrence rate. Uh, Ms. Sutton did an extensive study of all the cases in, seen in the Netherlands, and he found that local recurrence happened in 61% of the cases. Also, it is a deadly disease. In his study, 15% of the patients who were diagnosed with a conjunctival melanoma died from this disease. Genetically, it looks like a cutaneous melanoma. It has the same type of mutations and is really very different from the intraocular tumors. An extensive study was reported by Larsen in Denmark. Also, like the Netherlands, people with a light skin and light eyes. And uh, they have very good registries and could really study all the cases since 1960. The incidence had been increasing and that can be true for all of Europe. Patients could have this typical mutation in BRF, and patients with BRF mutations were younger. They had the T1 tumors, which are the smaller local tumors, often in the area of the conjunctiva that was sun exposed. And tumors with this type of mutation 
more often gave rise to metastases. In this picture, you see a bio biochemical pathway. If that BRF is mutated, it leads to more cell uh, division. And I hope. If you look at the, uh, the curve, then on top here, this is the survival of the patients without metastases. If the BRF was not mutated, survival was good. But if so this BRF was mutated, survival was only around 50%. That is not good for not, not developing metastases. And that especially happened in the young people who like to be in the sun and they get this bad type of malignancy. So it's a rare disease, and there are not very many series. We looked at the patients in Leiden, which is a national referral center in the Netherlands. And this is the list of our patients. 50% was male, 50% female. Age above and below 60 years was the same. Many of the tumors were located on the bulbus where a cataract surgeon will clearly see when there is something wrong. The T1s are the small ones. Majority of the tumors were small. So it, they can be uh, really small, as I will show you. This already existing pigmentation was present in the majority. And one third of the patients had already been treated elsewhere before they were sent to Leiden. So what happened to these patients? There are different things that you can look at. You can look at recurrence-free survival. As Misotten showed, this is a tumor that likes to recur in its uh, on the conjunctiva. You can look at metastasis-free survival and melanoma-related survival. There was a difference in the younger and older patients with regard to survival melanoma-related survival. The elder patients more frequently died from this disease. And when the lesion was located non-bulbar, on, uh, for instance, the eyelid, then survival was worse. The, of course, larger tumors had a higher chance of developing metastases. This is the age also for recurrence. Older age was not so good and metastasis-free survival and melanoma, and then the size of the tumor and the location. But one very important issue was where the first surgery occurred. Local recurrence, when treated at a center with experience in these lesions, was still not 100%, uh, not 0%, but Free survival, recurrence-free survival was 81% when the patient was initially for the first lesion treated at our institution. When they had first been treated elsewhere, 50% of the tumors recurred. One of the differences was that then often only surgery took place and no subsequent irradiation. And melanoma-related survival was worse when the patient was treated elsewhere first. These are the curves. If you look at the curve, if treated first in an expert center, survival without recurrence-free survival was over here. And if the, there were many more recurrences if treatment had taken place elsewhere first. So there was no difference in tumor size or thickness or stage with regard to survival. But it was the location of the treatment. Now, this is the most important picture. If you have been looking at your telephone up to now, then please stop at this moment and look at this slide. This is what is really important for cataract surgeons to realize. And these are nine pictures put together by my colleagues, Dr. Marinkovic and Dr. Brouwer. 
of examples of conjunctival melanomas that you can happen to see. One pigmented one. That's quite easy. There are blood vessels going there. It's dark. So you can see this is not right. Send it to a specialist. This one is a patient that I saw because of herpetic eye disease. And luckily, I have Dr. Marinkovic in the clinic next to me. And it looked a bit strange. And she removed it and it came back to the horror of the patient and Dr. Marinkovic and me that this was indeed, this tiny, tiny lesion was a conjunctival melanoma. They can also be located at the limbus. Here is a little something and here is more pigment. Both here and there were melanoma cells. And here on the inner side of the eyelid. A pinkish lesion here and a brownish here. All of this is conjunctival melanoma. And this one looks so simple as if it has been there for a while. Well, it was not. Also, this was a melanoma. And then these, of course, are cases that are difficult. You have the melanosis everywhere. And only when multiple biopsies are taken, one can see that perhaps in one of the locations there is a melanoma, especially the locations that have changed. And this is the typical amelanotic melanoma. Pinkish, it's not a pterygium, it's not a pinguagulum. It started out small and now it's quite large and anybody would recognize that you have to send this in to a specialist or for tumors. They can be melanotic, clear diagnosis, and they can be mixed, like that one, but here at the limbus, pinkish and darkish blue, a conjunctival melanoma. And so here you see them with the arrows, all different ones, and all of them conjunctival melanoma. So the take-home message is that conjunctival melanoma is a rare but aggressive disease. Treatment is excision, but in addition, it is important to irradiate. And therefore, patients with a lesion that could be a conjunctival melanoma should be referred to a center that has experience in removing them and, if necessary, treating them with adjuvant treatment. The difference in local recurrence and survival of the patients that uh, were treated first in a non-expert center that did not have this, these facilities is so large that if you see a patient and you think, maybe, maybe this can be a conjunctival melanoma, just send them in to a specialist. Refer the patient to a specialist center if at any time you may suspect a conjunctival melanoma. And thank you very much for your attention listening to this. And that one patient did very well after referral by the cataract doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. There is uh, time for one or two questions from the audience, if, if, they, if there is. No? Yes, there is one. You, you, you mentioned there was a big difference between the survival with the standard treatment and the special treatment. So what, what is this special treatment? It was just the, the addition of radiotherapy? Yes, and, and the way that the lesion is removed. Uh, the removal of the lesion is uh, by not touching the normal tissue again with the instruments after the conjunctival lesion has been touched. So you, you never move with the same instruments on different locations. And often you put uh, some uh, chemotherapy also locally on it. But it's a different approach from just cutting it off like you do with a pterygium. And, and the fact that you have also this relatively high amount of local recurrences yes. uh, could be explained by maybe the surgery has not been aggressive enough because normally the recurrence is in the same place or is in a different place? Usually they are in the same place. place. So yes. So, so for maybe removing yes. the sclera and putting a patch would be 
do the trick? The, 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 the cells are so malignant that if there is no irradiation on the larger one, the cells will come back. Mm. So this, the scleral patch will uh, make the tumor stay away for a while, but in the end they have a 50% chance of coming back. Also, 50% do well, but, but still. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. And then, uh, Rafael Baraker, in fact, you are the next. <laughs> and uh, he will speak about a postoperative toric IOL misalignment. Well, I understand that the, the, the topic was the management of the, the center and subluxated IOL. <laughs> anyway, uh, I just want to thank for, for the invitation, uh, especially Ima Jose and all the organizers. Uh, this is actually a theme that which I haven't really, uh, it's my first time I, I do this presentation. Uh, so I started with what I already had spent some time thinking about, which is in the case of the subluxated lens. Uh, the natural lens, and uh, uh, this is the uh, chart for the for the decision that I, I came out. The first thing is whether uh, is there an indication for, for for doing surgery in these in these cases? Because some of them, uh, especially if they are children, you may wait. So uh, there are situations where you have to observe and to go around the loop. And of course, when you have uh, an indication, then you have to start thinking. And the second thing, which is whether this is uh, progressive or it's non-progressive. Normally, uh, trauma uh, is going to be non-progressive. And of course, uh, then you have all the considerations like the size of the, uh, uh, the, the histones on the zonules, uh, which uh, as a rule for me, it's uh, less than four quadrants. For, for, for clock, clock, clock hours, I would probably treat it just with a simple uh, capsule ring, that may be uh, effective, and then it's okay. And of course, when you have diseases like Marfan or homocystinuria, you know it's going to be progressive, so you know you will need uh, capsular fixation. And that's also the case when you have either a greater defect or uh, you see that with a simple CTR is not effective. So then you need capsular fixation. Uh, and the next question is, is this feasible? Is this convenable? If it's the case, you can do some kind of suturing, uh, either as Ioni or you have this, all, all these other segments, anchors, etc. But there can be also situations where it's not feasible or not convenable, and in the end, you will have to maybe uh, to put an IOL without capsular support. We will talk on that on, on Sunday. So the, that would be my, my starting point. Of course, it's not the same with a decenter IOL, but you also have to consider the causes, whether it's a previous condition, or it's an intraoperative or a postoperative complication, and then also to measure the impact, uh, whether not just the physical amount of dissentration and the type of uh, IOL, of course, is going to be a uh, greater impact with a multifocal, but also it's also very important uh, how the patient feels, uh, and sometimes it's a very important uh, the tolerance or the expectation is, is a very important issue. For example, this lady already had a problem. She had been operated with a bifocal uh, lens in another clinic six months before. She was not happy. Vision was not perfect, uh, 2040 minus. The other eye was relatively amblyopic. The lens, uh, an M plus, was about 200 microns from the center, not bad centered, a little bit tilted. The macula was okay. But we waited for three months for neuroadaptation. She didn't improve. She was still not happy. So we did the interchange with a monofocal. But of course, this is not always easy. And we had a little bit of uh, zonal dehiscence. So we had to put uh, a CTR. We had a little bit of vitrectomy. And after initial improvement, uh, the macula was OK. Vision was better. But she had attacks of pain in the eye but with a totally white eye. And there was a little champignon of vitreous in the anterior chamber. Uh, after six months, she finally developed uh, macular edema. The eye was quiet in the outside, but in there was a sl slight disentration. So this is a slight disentration. It's a monofocal lens, but the patient is symptomatic, so I have to do something. So probably here I thought that the vitreous was the, uh, 
the, the main problem. So the uh, main uh, issue was to remove this uh, prolapse of vitreous. Uh, but then even uh, with the removal of the vitreous, the lens stayed a little bit the center. Uh, and hopefully uh, we had this uh, ring already, which is very helpful to, to, to put a suture. That would be, would be the, the simpler case. It's an older case, as you see, I'm still using the uh, proline. Uh, the proline has very nice, long, straight needles, but uh, the problem with proline is that it degrades with the uh, UV uh, light. So uh, I have now an increasing number of patients where uh, I use this technique and they're coming back with broken uh, stitches and, and the lens decenters again. So I'll show later that we are using other materials now, but that would be the simpler technique. Of course, you have to uh, rotate the uh, knot to make to put it inside the, you don't have to never leave it outside. Uh, and this is another case of a familial lens subluxation, non manfans I, uh, over 10 years ago, used a Sione ring, but 10 years later, proline uh, degraded, and uh, you had this usual uh, appearance with the bag and the lens dislocated. And in that particular case, I uh, used uh, a fixation technique, of course. Uh, one thing which is uh, frequent and is sometimes difficult to to, to, to measure before uh, getting to the operating room is uh, when you see the patient in the slit lamp, maybe the lens is moving, but still behind the pupil. But then when the patient is lying down, uh, uh, then maybe the, the, the lens is going to fall uh, into the vitreous, especially if there has been a vitrectomy or it's a highly myopic patient. But otherwise, you can see the technique uh, was also quite straightforward. Uh, uh, still uh, using here a combination of uh, some of the uh, you see I'm using this uh, instrument trying to uh, to the past plane to push the lens uh, towards the uh, uh, anterior chamber so sometimes you have to improvise one way to, uh, to uh, face the, the fact that proline uh, will degrade is to use a, a thicker, uh, like 9O proline, which maybe will last longer, but uh, actually eventually probably is going to degrade anyway. So here I'm using for the, at least for the upper uh, fixation, another material I'm using uh, polyester, 10 uh, mercelin, which is uh, really non-reabsorbable. Uh, the only problem is that this uh, suture comes only with small, standard, round, um, curved uh, needles, so it's uh, not that easy to pass these needles in the lower part of the anterior chamber. It's easier in the upper part. And then, of course, it's important not to close the uh, not until you have placed all the sutures that, so you can really center uh, properly the lens and the bag. So we will go forward, that's the result. This uh, patient has also this kind of dyscoria. So the, the general surgical options are emerging. One way, uh, if uh, the uh, sonios are good and the lens is the center inside the bag, maybe you can put some you can make some dissection, you can make put some devices in the back. Uh, Maria Jose has, uh, I've seen her doing beautiful videos of when her uh, devices to, to recenter the lens in the back. In my hands, this is not that frequent. Most of the time I see uh, the sonios are bad, the, the bag is moving, so I have to use some kind of back fixation together with the, with the IOL. And that can be done either with a classical scleral and conjunctival flap we have already uh, discussed about the materials. And of course, Gore-Tex is another possibility, although it was difficult to get in Spain until recently. And it's a relatively thick uh, material. And of course, uh, we also are using more now the Hoffman pockets, which avoids having to make the conjunctival dissection. So uh, that would be uh, just an example of using the Hoffman pockets so you, cannot, you don't have to really dissect the conjunctiva, although 
uh, they tend to bleed and sometimes it's not that easy. And here I'm using the intra 23 gauge uh, forceps to pass the needle. I think it's a little, maybe a little bit too much edited, but uh, I'm using this uh, intraocular forceps to pass the needles, the, the smaller needles of the, uh, of the mercilin uh, through the uh, sulcus. Uh, this is uh, the, another possibility, which is the use of cortex. You can see, uh, again, this is an old uh, PMMA uh, lens, which is good because, of course, uh, it's, uh, these haptics are very long, so they were easy to, to use as almost like a ring uh, to, to fixate. Uh, in this case, the luxation was only a lateral displacement, but uh, this is a recent case, which I did a few weeks ago, and initially I thought I would need only one uh, fixation, but, uh, and this was a high myopic eye, uh, once I passed this particular uh, suture through the Hoffman pocket, uh, with one, of course, one stitch goes under and the other in front of the haptic, then uh, I noticed that the other side was disinserting, so I had to pass to make another pocket in the, in the lower part and to, and to make a second, a second incision and second fixation uh, in this lower part. Uh, you see that the needles of the cortex are a little bit bigger, uh, but they are not big enough to work on the outside, so you still have to get used to, 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 the, to using this uh, instruments to manipulate the, uh, uh, the needles inside, inside the, uh, the anterior chamber. And this is another case, one of these cases where in the office, the lens was right behind the pupil moving, but once I was in the operating room, the whole thing was just hanging from a tiny little remnant of, of zonial. So the first thing was to save this, this bag for, from falling into, into the macula, and since this was one of these old models with these uh, closed haptics, it was relatively easy to, to pass uh, through them. Uh, again, this, uh, I think this is Merselin uh, sutures. You think the, the Hoffman uh, pockets. And uh, sometimes, of course, you also have cases which do not dilate well. I think it's a good idea to, uh, uh, to have good visualization at least until uh, everything is more or less in place, so this is why I, I prefer using uh, these uh, iris hooks also in this condition. Uh, but there are conditions where you, you think, okay, it's really worth the effort to uh, make all these maneuvers of, uh, sometimes uh, if you don't know exactly what kind of, of model of lens and whether it's going to be easier or not to, to, to fixate it to the sclera, uh, it might be easier just to remove it and to replace it. And I think uh, uh, nowadays one of the uh, simplest way of, of, of doing this is with the uh, artisan, which uh, I personally prefer to implant them always behind the iris. And, and that really, I, I've been doing for many years a lot of uh, sclera fixation and tunnel fixation. Uh, and uh, I have to say that uh, re this is really much, much simpler. Only, of course, you have to put a, Three, three stitches in the, in the limbus, that's the only thing. And that's a curious case, this is a, a, a I think it was two year old boy, boy with this huge cornea and probably had been operated in another place and they had tried to make a glue lens into the sulcus, into the sclera, but of course the sulcus is like 15 millimeters. So uh, you see that the haptic, uh, actually disinserted from the optic. So the, the, the lens was hanging from the other haptic. In this particular case, I think it's another, maybe the only solution here is actually the, the artisan. You see the artisan is nine millimeters and it looks like I'm almost uh, close to the sphincter of the iris, but it works. So uh, we can more or less end up with this uh, relatively similar uh, 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 flow chart. Uh, and, and the first thing is always if it is symptomatic or not. If it's not, I think it's always better to observe. Sometimes you see patients who have 
somehow the center lends it, but they don't really notice, so I think it's better not to be aggressive. And then, if it's symptomatic, then decide whether you have good or bad zonules. Of course, if you have good zonules, you may try this dissection of the fibrosis inside the, the bag and, and, and try to recenter the lens, although in my hands it is not very frequent. And if uh, the zonules are bad, you are going to need some kind of fixation of the lens and or the bag. And again, uh, the, uh, if the other branch wasn't effective, you go into the same. Next question, it's feasible, it's convenable. If it's feasible, you can do all these types of uh, scleral or even iris fixation with trying to use non-reabsorbable uh, sutures. If it's not, or you think it's too complicated, in some cases may be easier uh, to just replace the IOL and to use uh, your preferred technique for uh, non-supported uh, non lenses. So learn from the natural uh, supersatellite lens experience, I think, to consider the costs, to consider the impact and the patient expectations. Uh, if a simple lateral displacement, maybe uh, uh, scleral suture fixation is going to be uh, sufficient. Some cases, especially if you have to reconstruct the iris, uh, you may consider also to fixate into the iris. And of course, when the location is very advanced, you will need multiple point fixation or the replacement of uh, the uh, lens, either lady I'm using mostly, or either the artisan or the Jamani, uh, which we will demonstrate on uh, the session in next Sunday. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we have time for questions, so we'll have to move on. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, our final speaker for our symposium is Professor Peter Liedemann. Uh, Professor Liedemann will talk about retinal detachment after cataract surgery, post-cataract cystoid macular edema in diabetic patients. Uh, no, I, I think this was an attachment. I mean, I had to choose between two titles, so it's only retinal detachment after cataract surgery. Um, I have no interest to declare. Cataract surgery is one of the safest surgical procedures, but as the group of uh, Morten Lacour has shown in more than 200,000 patients after cataract surgery, and this is the operated eye, the retinal attachment rate is greatly increased compared to the fellow eye. And this is true for women and even more for men. And is especially high for younger persons. So in summary, eight years postoperatively, cataract operated eyes had an up to nine times higher risk of retinal detachment than non-operated eyes. And this may even increase Normally, you are not, you don't hear that before the surgery from the surgeon. Um, so, the cumulative risk increased up to 96 months, especially in people with long eyes, myopic patients, in men, and in younger people. So, the worst risk is for myopics younger than 50 years and male. So why is this? Probably because of posterior vitreous detachment, with, which occurs about at the same time as normally cataract surgery occurs. And this is, even if we have posterior vitreous detachment, the vitreous moves around in the eye, so you always should have a lens, which normally you have today, that has, is bulging into the vitreous cavity. We have done a group of patients, about 25 people, where we removed the vitreous during cataract surgery for long eyes. Yeah? I mean, young people, relatively young people, young, 50 years is not young, but younger people, more than 30 millimeters long, and you see the implant of about one diopter. And if we Compared to the risk published by Morten Lacour, this is the number of detachments that should occur 
but there was none in our group. We published this, but cataract surgeons didn't read it. They thought, what is that crazy thing making a vitrectomy during cataract surgery? Only the Chinese read it, and they published another paper in highly myopic patients and concluded that prophylactic vitrectomy may effectively prevent retinal detachment and clear lens extraction in high myopia. So that is an idea, but I don't know whether refractive surgeons would follow to it. Anyway, if the retinal detachment occurs, it may cause permanent loss of vision. And now this is, for example, a typical patient I got recently. We have descentered monofocal IOL, lens particles. We replaced the descentered monofocal IOL with a multifocal IOL. Afterwards, we had still particles in the vitreous body, no COVID tractomy performed, a toxic anterior segment reaction. Uh, we hope the macula has not yet detached, and we can therefore expect a good prognosis. I am gone. Bye, bye, bye. Okay, what do we do? The pseudophagic retinal detachment has unique characteristics. It has a quicker progression of detachment because there is more fluid, the vitreous is more fluidic. The retinal tears are smaller and multiple and can evade visualization, and it's anyway maybe difficult to see through cortical remnants or the capsular opacification. And of course, in multifocal IOLs, you have additional uh, difficulty to visualize the fundus. So scleral buckling provides enhanced support for the vitreous base, allows good visualization once you have contracted the buckle. And if you don't see the breaks, they hopefully lie on the buckle. And of course, cataract is no longer a problem because patients are anyway pseudophagic. In the SPR study, scleral buckling versus vitrectomy, which was done between 2001 and 13, there was a similar result between buckling and vitrectomy for visual uh, acuity. But in pseudophagic eyes, uh, vitrectomy with scleral buckle was recommended. That was the most successful group. But the problem was that the buckle was not randomly assigned. The surgeon could decide I use the buckle or not, depending on what he uh, deemed appropriate. And are scleral buckles really worth the problems they cause? They, it's more invasive, it takes longer, especially in glaucoma patients, it may be difficult. The blood circulation is influenced. Uh, sometimes you can't really see the holes and you have more scarring, dry eye, and double vision. And you get certainly myopia afterwards, and this is not nice if you have a multifocal lens. On the other hand, the retinal surgeon's goal is surgical reattachment, so what should we do? We did in the years around 2015, the Viper study in Germany mostly, Vitrectomy plus encircling band versus vitrectomy alone for the treatment of pseudophagic detachment. It was a randomized trial. So follow up to this SPR trial where the buckle was not randomly assigned. The uh, leading uh, investigator was Peter Walter from Aachen. And there were three publications. The cataract surgery had to be done at least three months before the onset of surgeons Valved and unvalved transconjunctival surgery was possible. Uh, circumferential prophylactic laser treatment was not allowed. And the endpoint was anatomical, no indication for any retina surgery. And for example, no additional gas injection, no additional vitrectomy, no additional buckle. So there were three groups, 20 gauge vitrectomy alone, uh, 23 at that time, or 25 gauge vitrectomy, always with gas, or um, oh, this was the control, vitrectomy alone, or vitrectomy with encircling band. These are the two main groups, and this was an additional group for experienced surgeons. Um, the results, here you see the 20 gauge with vitrectomy with encircling band, and this is without encircling band. So with encircling band, 
it was a little bit better, but this was not significant. Now comparing 20 gauge versus 25 gauge vitrectomy, um, 23, 25 was even better, so it certainly is not worse. At that time, that was important because these instruments weren't so good in those days. So the conclusion was vision improves in all patients. Vitrectomy alone with gas is an efficient and safe treatment for pseudophagic retinal detachment. An additional encircling band may be a little bit better, but it's not significantly better, so it's not better. And you have, in addition, the myopization. And small gauge vitrectomy is not inferior to 20 gauge vitrectomy. So the effect in the SPR trial could not be replicated. An additional sclerobuckle was not better. But there was another subgroup in these patients, and this is the people with inferior breaks at six o'clock, between five and seven, four and eight, three and nine, and with more than four holes. And here you see that an additional encircling band is a little bit better in those patients if they have holes in the inferior half. So then you should probably put an encircling band. This spring, a Cochrane database review was published, and they said there's really not much difference between vitrectomy and scleral buckling for simple retinal attachments. They didn't really make a big difference between uh, faking and pseudo faking detachments. So, in the end, this means you can choose what you want, but. Uh, in my patient, you see in the beginning, the visualization was not perfect at least. Of course, the retina was, the macula was detached when it came. And of course, after the first surgery, only vitrectomy, there was a redetachment. So now after an additional sclerobuckle, buckle, everything is solved. So I just wanted to show that pseudophagic detachment is still a problem and uh, in the end, you should start with vitrectomy alone, maybe 23, 25 surgery, and if it doesn't help, add an additional buckle. Thank you. So thank you very much. Can we have the, a little bit more lights? And uh, please, uh, Peter, you can sit and join us here on the, on the table. It is, uh, we have still some time for a couple of questions, if people do have some questions. Do not hesitate to come here and to to to, to propose your question on the micros on the microphone. Yeah. yeah. I have a question to Professor Barakar. It's probably the very basic question, but when you decide on the type of surgery or attitude towards a spe specific case, do you base your opinion about uh, zonal's weakness on UBM or on stethum examination? How do you decide? Yeah, yeah. well, it's a, it's a good question because it's not easy to answer. Uh, but I would say mostly I rely on the uh, slit lamp examination so to try to degrade the, the degree of uh, the uh, movement of the pseudophagodonesis or, or the actual more than that. Uh, of, of the lens in the back. Uh, I mean, there are two kinds of situations. One is when you have just a disintegration and then you hesitate whether this is going to really disturb uh, more or less the patient and it depends on the whole context, context of, of, of his situation, how is the retina, whether it was multifocal, monofocal, etc. And then you have the real uh, displaced, dislocated or subluxated lenses. Uh, and uh, the main, my main concern is whether I am going to be uh, good with only one uh, fixation, normally in the upper part, or I'm going to, to need several, because normally those in the lower part are the more difficult to, to pass. Uh, but as I've shown, uh, sometimes you have surprises because you think that maybe uh, you're going to need one and then the whole, uh, uh, in, in the operating room, you realize that the whole zone is totally destroyed. So do you perform UBM at any situation before some surgery with IOL dislocation or subluxation? 
Not particularly UBM. I, I do normally anterior segment OCT to, mm -hmm. to have uh, maybe with the UBM, if you are there watching the UBM, you may uh, have another vision of the of the movements of, of right. the back. But mainly uh, slip up examination and ASOCT. Well, my main examination is still a slit lamp. Slit lamp. A slit lamp and to see how uh, the lens and the back is moving. In case uh, you hesitate, there is still the option of the endoscope that you can have a look directly during the surgery and use an endoscope and see whether there is sufficient support of the zonules. Uh, yeah, this can help, but uh, it, it, is a, it is a good question because still now what we do, what we cannot visualize or evaluate preoperatively, also not in cataract, regular cataract surgery, is the shape or the, the, the the, the zonules, huh? this is still something that we are missing. And that may be sometimes also the reason why we have postoperative um, surprises in the refraction. Yeah, uh, really, uh, I also stress that you should not be, it, normally the, the cornea, of course, is transparent. You can see you don't really need that many special uh, technologies to see what's going on, but of course, if in the surgery, your pupil is not large enough. Uh, do not hesitate in using whatever you need to, 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 to have a, a, a wide pupil during the, during the surgery. If I can ask a question for Martine, we often see a little bit of melanosis. What do, what do we have to do with that? Photograph it precisely. And if you see any changes, then send it to a specialist, but take good photographs that goes for all the different lesions. Yeah. If they change, that is a very important warning sign. And how frequent, what is the interval between the pictures that you would expect, would propose? Depends on the case, but probably every three four to four months, three if, four if you months. see a lot of melanosis yeah. in an yeah. uh, uh, individual who is not supposed to have that. In Asia, of course, there are mm -hmm. many people who uh, have melanosis, yeah, but yeah. then it's racial uh, yeah. change of color. Yeah. But in a light-skinned person, uh, every three to four months, because it's not supposed to be there. Yeah. Are you also using the age as a reference? More frequent if it is a younger patient or not? No. Okay. No more questions? We are absolutely well on time. Thank you for all the, the speakers today. Thank you for you for being here and for your support and uh, have a good afternoon.